Good morning, everyone, and welcome to OLC 4.0. This is uh, yeah, Term 1B. It's uh, today, December 8th, 2022. We are on class number 16, covering Unit 2, Lesson 6. And we'll look at assignments 24, 25, and then hopefully 26 if we, if we have enough time. So we didn't quite finish assignment 24 from yesterday, so I want to come back to that one. So, so we are in week four of classes in term 1B. We're getting really close to our holiday break where there'll be, you know, we have, uh, that's our two week holiday break. January 26th will be the last day of broadcast. And then after that, you will have a final exam to finish off this course. So here's our class schedule. Weeks 1, 2, and 3 uh, are completed. We covered assign uh, Unit 1. We're now on Week 4 and Week 5. So Unit 2 will cover Week 4 and Week 5. Then Unit 3 will span Week 6 and 7. Hopefully have that wrapped up by Week 6. Uh, and then Unit 4 will be Week 8 and 9. And then... We'll uh, do some final exam. We'll be doing some prep and some study and, you know, some tips and some strategies where I will help you to give you everything you need to pass that exam successfully. So there's many ways to watch in and participate with the class live. So if you're doing that today, then you know at least one of these methods. You can always pause the screen and um, reach out to your DEC to find out how to participate in the live broadcast. Check out the YouTube channel, Laverty Wassa, to watch all of the lectures. Every class that I do, I put on my YouTube channel, so we should have 16 of them up very soon. Talk to your DEC to submit your work, to scan it. You can send it in yourself. There's many ways you can send in assignments. The main important thing is just to simply get them into your teacher, get them into myself. If you don't know how to uh, submit your stuff, if you don't know how to tune in live, this is how you do it. So send me an email, ask me any question, find me on Facebook, and phone one of these two numbers. The first one, if you're in the Sulacote area, the second one is a toll-free long distance number. Talk to me Monday through Friday, 9 till 3 Central Standard Time. That's when to find me. And you should con yeah, contact me through email, Facebook, Messenger, or phone, text. This is, you know, any questions you might have. I'm here to help. You should have read all pages of Unit 1. You should have read the first pages, you know, 1 through 17 of Unit 2 have uh, assignments 1 through 18, that's unit 1. So you should have those completed by now, and you should uh, be making a plan for completing assignment 19 and beyond. All right, so today's lesson, we'll look at the words of the day, today's headline, we'll look at assignments 24, 25, and hopefully 26. Our learning goal is to review the writing process in regards to an information paragraph and an opinion article. And we'll know we're successful if we can use this writing process to guide the completion of assignments 24, 26, you know, and let's say hopefully 20, sorry, 24, 25, and hopefully 26 if we have enough time. So, on to the words of the day. Here's our little visual primer. So we've got a political cartoonist, and he's writing what it means to... He's using his medium of political cartoons to talk about what it means to be a political cartoonist. So what is... So sometimes you call them an, an, an editorial cartoon. You might also heard them referred to as political cartoons. They often deal with political topics with politicians, with parties, with leaders, things like that. So editorial or political cartoons try to grind down a news story into a single image. It's harder than it looks. So much news, can't keep up. 
Unlike fact-based reporting, a cartoon is opinion. It's not the news, okay? So today we're going to talk a lot about opinion versus facts. What's the difference? Why is that important? Sorry. So any news story can be cartoon fodder. So fodder is just, you know, stuff that you feed animals and it's material for whatever you're writing about. Sometimes it makes you laugh. Sometimes it makes you angry. But at least they will get you talking. So that's a really good point, right? So at least it gets the conversation started. So our Anishinaabe Moen word is uh, Ijitwawin, which is a certain way of belief, a religion, a culture. So, And then on the other side, I have an English word, opinion, a view or judgment about something, not necessarily based on fact or knowledge. So, so religion and opinion are not the same thing, but they are similar in the fact that they're not really fact-based um, there may be religious knowledge involved, but, you know, the, uh, the religion you believe and, and the way of life that you, that you follow is, in a way, it's your opinion. It's, it's you know, it's based on what you believe is true. Um, it may not be uh, based upon facts or, or knowledge, but, you know, it's a certain way of thinking about the world. It, it's a worldview. It's, uh, it's a way of seeing the world. So... The way that we see the world and the things that we want to be true sometimes aren't true, right? And it's, and it's kind of hard to, to accept that and to believe that sometimes we're wrong and we want to believe that we're right all the time. That's just human nature, but that is just simply the way it is. So, you know, we're talking about like a worldview. So we have worldviews. We all have belief systems. And as much as we'd like to think that our, our belief systems and our worldview is always right and is informed by facts and reality, oftentimes it's not. We just simply want things to be true. So that's what you know having an opinion is, right? And we're, we're going to talk about opinions and having opinions that are based upon fact to sort of like strengthen our opinion and to challenge our own views and to challenge our own opinions. So that's what I want to touch on today. So so here's some political cartoons. So we've got Trump on the left, uh, Biden on the right. So the first panel says, I'm getting a second opinion from my gut. So the author's expressing an opinion, and I would say the opinion, you know, is... Uh, actually, not much room to write there, but the opinion is basically Trump doesn't bases policy doesn't base his decisions on evidence and science he just trusts his gut feeling <laughs> that's what they're saying the second panel here we've got the elephant here with the beat up chewed ears and the elephant is of course the symbol of the republican party and so the elephant is beat up and torn but it's happy right so the image here is that you know trump may have won but his party is beat up and in a really bad spot, but they don't care because he's their champion and they support him no matter what. On the right, we've got Joe Biden saying, you're strong as hell. And who's strong as hell? The economy, right? So inflation, and that's the cost of like groceries and gas going up. That's hurting everybody. It's hurting the economy. But he is, you notice his eyes are closed, right? He's blind to what's really happening. He thinks that everything's great. His shoe laces are untied, right? Nice little detail there from the cartoonist. Uh, so he believes everything's fine, but obviously, according to this cartoon, it's not. And in the second uh, political cartoon, uh, Joe Biden says, I'm decreasing your debt and increasing there. So he's decreasing student debt at the expense of the taxpayer, right? So he's unloading this debt from this person and slamming it on to the taxpayer. Um, students are, are taxpayers too, right? So um, that's one thing I'd point out about this. But So they're expressing an opinion, and that opinion may be based on facts. It may be based on, you know, but it's not news. They're not just giving you information. They're trying to make you think a certain way. 
So we got um, a couple of more Anishinaabe Moan words. We've got Waya Katam, which is he or she hears the right thing, finds out the truth. And Debwe, which is he or she tells the truth, speaks the truth. So again, we're looking at truth. You know, the truth versus just somebody's opinion, right? And this is why people argue online, right? They think that I'm speaking the truth and you're just speaking an opinion, right? So, in English, I've got a couple of words up on the board. An assumption is something that you take for granted. So, when you take it for granted, that means there's no explanation. You know, no explanation needed. No explanation, no proof. You just take it for granted. It's given to you. It's granted. Um, an impression is a notion or a remembrance, a belief, often of a vague or indistinct nature. So it's just like this vague kind of feeling you have about something. Again, not based on explanation, not based on proof. Speculation is the contemplation or consideration of some subject. So when we speculate, we make guesses, we... We try to explore a problem. We discover a problem. But again, with all these things, you know, we're talking about a lack of evidence. A, la a, a lack of evidence or a lack of reason. And all of this is kind of underlying something that I want you to work on uh, as, we, as you work on your article. Your, so... In Unit 2, you have to write four paragraphs expressing an opinion, and it's worth 50 marks, so it's a big chunk of your marks in Unit 2, and you have to ex express an opinion on something. And so I don't want you to make assumptions and just go off of vague impressions and speculate. I want you to use evidence and use reasons to back up why you think you're right. So the last word of the day is theory, and a theory can be a group of uh, general propositions commonly regarded as correct that can be used as principles of explanation and prediction for a class of phenomena. So, you know, we have a theory, you know, we, we have a theory of gravity. We have all kinds of theories, uh, you know, evolution. And they're supposed to help us understand the world. But uh, at the end of the day, they are, they are still ideas. And then, of course, a theory can also be, you know, a proposed explanation uh, that still uh, is conjectural. It's still experimental. Um, it's not, you know, it's still a, it's so, so sometimes, you know, theory is an interesting word because a theory can be something that's, like, really established and people, like, almost take as fact. But then someone can also say, oh, that's just a theory. You know, you're, you're just making guesses. You're just... You're just guessing that's how the world's going to be, right? So it's got two meanings, right? And that's what, that's what makes English such a hard language. You know, the word theory, depending on how you use it, almost has two very different meanings, like opposite meanings. It can either mean something that's like completely true and it's like 99% true. It happens all the time. But it can also mean something that's you're just guessing and you're just randomly guessing at it. So depending on how you use the word, and the context, it, it's got a really different meaning, okay? I love this uh, little cartoon. You may have seen this e-card on Facebook. People can make their own cards and share them with their friends on Facebook or whatever, social media. I want you to look at that and see if you can spot the mistakes, because there's quite a few. <laughs> and we can we can look at that and we can... We can so let's first correct some of the grammar mistakes. So uh, first one, difference is spelled wrong. Should be an E there. So the difference between a fact and an opinion is an opinion is what you think, a fact is what I think. They forgot the period at the end of this one. And uh, the difference between a fact and an opinion is, and this comma, uh, you know, no comma is needed there. We don't need a comma here. But grammar and spelling mistakes wrong it's funny but it's it, i think it's true right so people often think that they're right no matter what and you know they speak the truth they're speaking facts but everybody else is just speaking their opinion right so 
we're gonna so again we're it, it's opinion versus fact and our opinions can be based on facts right but our facts can't really be based on opinions so all right so here's today's headline so Danielle Smith's Sovereignty Act is a silly political dare written in crayon. And there she is, speaking at a news conference in Edmonton on November 29th. There's our headline. And if we break that down, so Daniel Smith. So again, this is a proper noun. Both of these are proper nouns. That's why it's capital Smith, capital Danielle, capital Sovereignty, capital Act. So, and it's her act. That's why the apostrophe S is there. It's something that belongs to her. So you may have heard about this in the news. You may have not, but it's, um, she's proposing a Sovereignty Act where Alberta becomes separate from Canada, and it's getting a lot of criticism from the federal government who's trying to keep Canada together. It's getting a lot of criticism from a lot of indigenous groups in Alberta who think that um, this bill is going to make it really uh, easy for like corporations to um, sort of like uh, take over indigenous land and you know uh, pollute it and it's going to um, it has the danger of like skipping all the consultation process that's supposed to happen when a corporation tries to establish a business or some kind of enterprise on indigenous land. So that's, that's some of the criticism it, it's been getting. So it's an act. It belongs to her. Is is a verb. Um, oh, that's not a preposition. Made a mistake. Remember, articles are a, an, and the. So this is an article. The author believes it's silly. It's political. These are adjectives. A silly political dare, right? So what the dare is two things. It is both silly and political. And I love this part. It is written, verb, in crayon, right? So she believes it's written in crayon. That's a great word to use, right? So uh, a crayon is something used by a child. It's not serious. It's temporary. Um, so that's what they're saying, right? When, when, when I say that you've written something in crayon, you know, it's a dig, it's an insult and, it, and it's meant that way. So, so this article is, is this, this is not, it's not news. Okay. Capital N news, you know, it's not news, right? It is opinion. Sometimes we call these an op ed piece, right? an opinion editorial. So that's what this is, right? So the someone's offering their opinion, okay? We'll do a little breakdown of the lead paragraph of this article. So remember, it's not a news report. So the author is not giving you information. They're not telling you the who, what, where, and why, and how. They might give you that stuff, but they're trying to persuade you and let them know that what they're saying is right. So we have a, 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 a rhetorical and sarcastic question meant to grab the reader's attention. This is, uh, this is the author's hook, okay? So a rhetorical question is one that you ask and you're not really expecting an answer. You just say it to get people's attention. Like, yeah, you just say it to get people's attention. You're not, you're not really expecting an answer. So don't you hate it when you sit down to write your signature piece of legislation and you accidentally give your cabinet the power to unilaterally, unilaterally rewrite laws, bypassing the legislative assembly. So um, what is the tone of this sentence? The tone of the sentence is sarcastic, right? She's being, she's being really sarcastic. She's trying to, be, trying to be funny, right? And I would use a nice word here, bombastic. She's uh, dropping a bomb. She's trying to get your attention. So the joke here is that she's like, you know, don't you just hate it when this happens? Like it's a really common situation. And so, of course, uh, writing legislation is not common. You know, 99.9% .9 of humans will never do it uh, or be in charge of an entire party, right? So she's like, 
trying to be funny, trying to get your attention. And who was the intended audience for this opinion piece? I would say, you know, uh, people, simply it's people into politics. You know, uh, especially, especially Albertans, right? So people living in Alberta and people who care about Alberta, right? If you don't care about politics, you're not going to care about this article. But that's what she's used to grab your attention. And when we write an opinion article, we always express an opinion. So I've actually highlighted the, the topic, the subject, uh, and the opinion being expressed. So it's in blue there. Alberta Premier Daniel Smith introduced Bill 1, granting herself and her cabinet sweeping and undemocratic closed doors powers. Okay? So sweeping just means like uh like it covers like everything it like sweeps over the landscape right um undemocratic means that people won't vote on it they'll just be able to do stuff without the people like holding them accountable and closed doors means like they'll be able to make decisions behind closed doors and not get consultation from indigenous groups not get sympathy or not get uh feedback from the people they can they can just do whatever they want so that is an opinion. It may be right. It may be wrong. She spends the rest of the article giving reasons for why she's right. Okay? So she's talking about a very serious subject, but she's doing it in a way that, you know, she thinks is funny and entertaining. But at the end of the day, she's trying to persuade us, trying to make us think that she's right. You know, it starts off, the other day I accidentally wrote down 2 p.m. instead of 1 p.m. for an upcoming appointment. So I have some sympathy for Alberta Premier Daniel Smith, who must have had a similarly absent-minded moment when she forgot that she was supposed to be a libertarian and introduced Bill 1. So she, again, she's trying to be funny, where like, you know, like she's, you know, making an innocent mistake and maybe she made a few mistakes when she wrote this act, but in reality, you know, so she's, Trying to use humor, uh, I would say, and also the style of the tone is very uh, conversational. It's like she's having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the reader. So she's talking about a very serious subject, uh, a very intellectual, political subject, but she's trying to make it fun. And maybe she's trying to get people involved in politics who might otherwise not be involved in politics or may not care. So, I want to go back uh, to assignment 24, which we, I covered yesterday, but didn't really get a chance to finish in as much detail as I wanted. So, we were talking about writing a how-to article, a how-to paragraph, an information paragraph. And so, we, we have some topics, how to clean a walleye, how to make bandic, how to change a tire. And you can also choose your own topic. And what I suggest that you do is you find something productive that you love to do, and imagine you're going to get paid to teach it, and you've got to teach someone how to do it, but you can't sit down next to them. You have to write a paragraph that shows them how to do it. And I walked you through some of those steps, okay? So the first step was planning, was to talk about, you know, um, things I love to do slash can teach. So if you go back to yesterday's class, class 15, I brainstormed a whole bunch of things. But the one that I settled upon was, um, you know, was how to write a short story. It's something I love to do, and it's something that I could teach people. So how to write a short story, that's the, uh, that's the topic that's the topic that I settled on, okay? So that's my that's my topic. That's the one that I picked. Step 1B was after choosing your thing to do, then you come up with 3 to 5 points, specific details, right? So I'm always using that word, right? Always be specific related to your topic that could be included in your paragraph. So when you teach someone how to do something, it's always going to involve steps, right? Um, and anything worth teaching how to do, 
it's going to involve many steps and and it's not just it's not just your job to list them step one step two step three it's your job is to guide the person through those steps right like if you're teaching a young person how to do math and fractions and they're really struggling with it you don't just say do this do that do this you, you sort of help them give them the big, give them the big picture guide them through it um, maybe tell them some things they should watch out for right so that's you're a guide you're helping someone to figure out how to do something right so you're the master you know how to do that thing you're really good at it um, but the hard part you know you like the easy part for you is doing the thing the hard part for you is explaining it in a way that someone can get it so that's that's the that's the challenge to you how do you explain how to do it so and so you gotta start with some specific details and so these are the details that I came up with and you don't have to have them in order but I I, I started to think about you know how I, how I would approach this and so I said I had choose a genre which is like uh, sci-fi horror fantasy you know for example so you, ch you choose a genre you choose uh, slash create a character uh, you know put the character in a setting and then give them a problem okay that's what I would suggest to do so choose a genre create a character put that character in a setting give them a problem step 2a writing come up with a topic opening sentence that introduces what you are teaching and gets the reader interested to know more this is your hook right so I like the idea of a hook right so once again, there's my little fish. There's the hook. The fish is the reader. The hook is your first sentence, all right? Get the fish to bite the hook, okay? Give them a good opening sentence, right? Um, and one, I mean, I, I read some articles online on how to write a, an effective how-to sentence. And one of the best pieces of advice, I think, that I came across was to give the reader some kind of a promise and say, like, you know, um, after you follow my steps, you're, you're going to be able to do this, right? So it's like, uh, how, to do, how, to, how to play this is hard, but not if you follow my steps. And you'll, you'll be able to come up with one good idea for a story if you follow my steps. So you might want to say, like, you know, introduce your topic what you're going to teach and then tell the reader how you're going to teach it or what they're going to get out of it right so you need a good opening sentence so and I did this a little bit yesterday but I'll do it again so writing a short story can be uh, challenging but my steps will I don't know get you started something like that I don't know that's my first idea right when we write it's just important to put an idea on the page and you know this this is my first that's my first draft my first draft my first attempt okay whoops 
my first draft or attempt at an at an opening hook, right? I might come back and change this, okay? Um, so that's but that's my opening sentence for now. Step two B writing. Turn your three to five points from step one B into sentences. Write one sentence or more than one sentence if you have more to say for each point, okay? So then I would go back and for each point that I had, so like let's say uh, that was my point was choose a genre. And then to turn that into a sentence, I might say something like uh, you need to uh, decide which genre your story will will be um, for example um, you could write a horror story or one set um, on the moon. And I kind of like that, you know, one set on the moon, that's fantasy. And then maybe instead of saying horror story, I'm just going to make some notes to myself. I could provide a specific example. But that's, you know, that's my point, that, the, that they need to choose a genre, and that's my sentence, right? So, so I'm going to write a sentence for each one of my points, okay? And then once I've got that, then I've got a pretty good starting sp point, okay? Um, and then you might want to use you might want to show sequence, and we do this to connect to connect our points. Okay. So we want to use like first you do this, then you do that. Secondly, you might want to do this. You know, following choosing a genre, then do this. You know, at this time in the process, you might want to think about this. You know, now it's time to come up with the character. Next, we should write a backstory for our character. Um, finally, you know, try to come up with a problem for your character. Um, so th these are words you want to use. They're sequential words. They, um, they, they show sequence. They show, um, they connect our points and they give order or steps, right? They just, th it's a process, right? Do this, do that, do that, right? And so it gives it gives structure to your writing, and it keeps the it keeps the process moving forward, right? So I would recommend using some of these words and terms, using your transition words is what we call them, or phrases, right? So they're transitions; they go from one phase to the next phase. So I would strongly recommend you use those in your writing, okay? Step two C of the process um, for the concluding last sentence: simply rewrite your topic sentence. Using different words, you can summarize your steps or encourage the reader to try this out for themselves. And then a concluding sentence that I might include would be, um, we may not have a finished story. But we have a strong foundation to build on. So I'm just kind of I'm kind of thinking about my overall strategy now that I've written down a few points. So maybe my information paragraph won't be how to write a short story. So I'll just put a little note to myself here. So note um, uh, my topic. My topic is starting. Starting a story. 
you know, or let's just say uh, generating a concept. So maybe my information paragraph, it's not how to write a short story because it's hard, it's hard to like um, tell someone how to write a story in one paragraph. Maybe my paragraph is going to be how to start one and how to generate that concept, right? How to get that basic seed for an idea. So, and, and I didn't really realize that until I started talking about it and, and writing about it with you today. So that's, it's kind of cool how that works. So you have an initial idea. You think that's what you're going to do. But then as you write it down, as you work through it, as you revise. So this is um, what I just did there is an example of revision, right? When we do stuff like this, we are revising, right? We are talking about the big picture stuff, right? So I, that's a pretty big revision, right? But I think it's one that's going to make my, my article stronger, right? My information paragraph stronger. So... Once we have that down, you're going to look at your opening sentence, look at your points, look at your concluding sentence, and ask yourself these questions. Is there anything missing? Is everything in the right order? Uh, can I come up with a better title? Uh, and then make any changes as you see fit, like I just did. So maybe I'm, I want to revise my general approach. Then step four, we go into the editing process, and we want to go through with a different colored pen or a pencil to make edits. So that's you know, I've talked a lot about reading your stuff out loud, having somebody else read your work, recording your stuff into a microphone. So all things I strongly believe in. Here's one more tip. Uh, use a different colored pen or pencil to make edits. So, you know, so make, make the edits stand out. If you're using a word processor, use a red or a green or a blue colored font for your edits to make them stand out and make them jump off the page so your your first draft and your edits are really noticeable they're different and check your grammar your spelling use of capital letters punctuation etc all right assignment 25 so, so for assignment 25 we are making a prediction okay and we're, and we're talking about Jimmy Comes Home, okay? Um, so before you read the next chapter, chapter number four of Jimmy Comes Home. So before, right, keyword before, because we're making a prediction. Before you read the next chapter four of your novel, skim and scan the pages and write down any five words that stand out besides... Beside the words, indicate why they stand out for you. Point form is okay. Also, you are to use each word in a new sentence of your own. So you look at chapter 4, and I'm just scanning it right now. It's called The Cabin. Um, you know, we've got... we've got um, So the, Jimmy's in the cabin with Gary, and they're talking about uh, Winnipeg and Thompson and doing their illicit activities, their drug running. So uh, this, so, uh, this very much reminds me of Trailer Park Boys. Um, if, if you've ever seen the show Trailer Park Boys where um, the characters are constantly going to jail and trying to get clean and trying to live this honest lifestyle. But everywhere they go, they've got a friend of theirs who's trying to come up with some illegal scheme to make money that usually involves drug and alcohol and stealing stuff. and uh, trying to bring them back to jail. So that's very much, you know, Jimmy's life, right? So he's trying to live a better life. He knows that uh, something is, is wrong in his life, but he's got all these people trying to bring him back into the dark side, right? So he's having a hard time. So, so we're skimming and scanning. We're just looking at the paragraphs. We're not reading. We're just kind of glancing over and then the note there says, skimming and scanning is not usually something you would do with a novel. Can you think of a reason why? And so if you think back, you know, we, we skim something to look at the overall structure of it. And, and then we scan looking for specific things. So usually when you read a novel, it's giving you a new story. It's one you've never heard before. So you're not really looking for stuff. You know, you, you're just letting it come to you. So that's kind of part of the answer there. Why? 
why we don't why we don't usually skim and scan a novel. So you want to write down those five words. Write down you know any five words that get your attention. Right, so in your notebook, on your word processor, processor, write down your five words, okay? So you write down the words, right? So that's the word. Um, you have to write down why, why you picked it, okay? So the word, why you picked it, um, Let's just, yeah, we'll just cut that. Any five words. So, write down the word. Tell me why it got your attention, why you picked it. And then you got to use it in a sentence. Okay? So, three parts. Look at the word, why you picked it, use it in a sentence. Uh, if the reason you, you picked it, because you don't know what it means... You know, look up in the dictionary, okay? Do that step two. Learn what that word means. Use it in your own sentence. You may have heard the phrase, uh, show me something, um, or, you know, tell me something and I'll forget. Show me something and I might remember. You know, involve me or make me do it and then I will remember. So the best way to learn a new word is to use it in a sentence. So that, that's the best way to learn a new word. So learning the definition is only one step of the process. Uh, you need to actually use it to understand how it works and, and for your brain to remember it. So, And then the second part of assignment 25 is based on the words that stood out for you as well as the title of the chapter, make a prediction as to what the main idea of this chapter will be. Your answer will contain at least three sentences. So you need three full sentences. on what this is what will happen in chapter four which is titled the cabin it's not about you being right so I I, I don't I don't grade your assignment on you being right on you making the correct prediction. What I grade you on is just writing in full sentences. Make a prediction. That's, the, that's all you have to do. So um, on what, and then what's going to happen? What's the main idea? What's, what are we going to learn about Jimmy? Um, mem remember, the novel is Jimmy Comes Home. So most chapters uh, are, are talking about Jimmy. So what's going to happen to Jimmy in Chapter 4? What's he going to learn? What's he going to go through? What's he going to do? What's he going to struggle with, right? Three full sentences. Okay. We've got a little under 10 minutes here where we will talk about chapter, or sorry, assignment 26. Remember, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend uh, Monday's class talking about this too, but we're going to get a, a headway into this today, okay? So it's a series of paragraphs expressing an opinion, 50 marks, okay? And what we're talking about here is persuasive writing. So remember we talked about um, the pie. So writing either persuades, it persuades, it informs, or it entertains. This is the primary purpose, okay? Some writing can do all three if it's very well executed, but most writing, uh, it either, it's either meant to persuade us, inform us, or entertain us, right? So persuasive writing is when we express an opinion in writing or other platforms, like either th uh, through uh, talking or you know, giving a speech or putting an ad in the, in, the, in, the, in the newspaper or on Facebook, but when we express an opinion, our purpose is to convince the readers that we are right. We might entertain them or inform them along the way, but our main purpose is to persuade. Okay? 
That's our main purpose. I want to show you that I'm right. That's what I'm trying to do here, right? So I'm going to use information, and I might entertain you and try to make you laugh or think or cry, but my main point is to show you that I'm right. So advertisers use persuasive writing all the time because their main purpose is to make money. And the main way they can make money is to convince you to buy a product. So what, what are they trying to persuade you about? They're trying to persuade you that you should buy this product, that you need this product, that this product has to be in your life. It's a good product. It's worth your hard-earned money, right? So they use persuasive writing in their advertisings and their radio ads. Politicians use persuasive writing to try and make us vote for them. They want us to believe that they're right, that they're the person for the job, that they're the ones who should lead our communities, right? That's what they're trying to do. Um, a community activist, so someone who's trying to make their community a better place, they're trying to convince people that what they are fighting for is right and should be supported, right? So they're going to try and persuade people. If they believe that they're on a mission and they're trying to fix something wrong in their community, it's not just enough to put out information. You have to persuade people. You've got to convince them that what you're doing is right. And it should be supported. Here's the general format for an opinion article or an op-ed, right, for example. An op-ed, an opinion piece, um, any kind of persuasive writing. It's going to follow this format. So as soon as possible, you have to make a statement of your opinion. So you should, you should get that out of the way as soon as possible. State your opinion. What are you talking about? What, so make a statement of your opinion. Then you provide evidence for why you are right. And this includes facts, stats, events, anecdotes, uh, quotes from experts, right? So, you know, anecdotes are stories. Your concluding comments should restate your opinion and connections, and you might offer next steps. You know, because I am right on this, we should. You know, for that, that's something you could say, right? You might wanna, you might wanna restate your opinion a few times, right? So in the middle here, right? So <coughs> you're constantly reminding the reader of what you're talking about, and you know, like. You're trying to convince them that you are right. So you're expressing an opinion, but if you've ever seen uh, two people argue online, like on a Facebook page, and they go back and forth, and they keep throwing facts and stories at each other, and like nobody ever agrees. So it's very hard to do, right? So it's very hard to convince someone that you're right um, if, they, if, they, if they think you're wrong from the beginning, right? So it's really hard to do. So you have to be convincing, and you have to give lots of evidence. And you may not change how somebody thinks, but you may force them to reevaluate their own thinking and maybe you know, plant a seed in their brains that maybe what they think is wrong. So, so for this assignment, you have to choose one of the following statements and, ke to, uh, and keep in mind. Uh, decide whether you agree with it or not. Okay, So you have to agree with the statement or not. The first one is men should be forced by law to financially support any children they have. So do you agree with that statement or do you disagree? Key word here is forced by law. So we're not, we're not arguing, you know, um, should men support kids that they have? You know, it, should they do that? Is that the right thing to do? No. What we're arguing is that should they be forced by law to do that, right? So should they be forced to pay child support? That's the argument. Do you agree with that statement or do you disagree? And then you got to explain why. Uh, topic two. Young people who return from juvenile detention should have to complete community service hours and write letters of apology for past behaviors. So again... Do you agree or disagree with that statement? <laughs> Step one, 
planning. So we'll, we'll just talk about step one. So first, you must choose which issue you are going to write about and decide if you agree or disagree with the statement. Then you can rephrase the statement so it shows your opinion and explains why you think it is true or not true, depending on your opinion. So we'll just we'll end with that today, um, and that's first step. So so you, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna choose number two. So young people who return from juvenile detention should have to complete community service hours. So um, so I'm gonna say. Um, So my argument here, I, I, I'm going to make a stab at it here. I'm just going to put down some, so so what I'm doing here is step one of my planning process is I'm going to restate uh, restate the, the statement. And it's going to be in my words, right? That's That's the important thing, right? So. And here's here's my take on this situation. So I'm going to say juvenile juvenile uh, offenders should have the option of doing. Uh, community service hours and writing letters. Uh, I guess writing, what are we going to call them? Apology letters. After being released. So that's my main thinking on this. I don't think they should have to do it, I, I, and I think it might lead to some fake apologies, um, and you know, forcing someone to do community hours. Um, so that that's my general thinking. Is I I think you know, um, I think they should have the option uh, of doing that. It it should be an option given to offenders that they can explore if they want to, if they have the inclination. And I think it'll make for a much better process. So that's my that's my initial thought. That's what I'm doing. I'm I'm gonna re I restated it. That's what I think is true. And then you're gonna brainstorm uh, a list of at least five points or reasons for why you're right. So we all like giving opinions. What's what's hard and what's challenging is, is backing up your opinion, right? So you need to be as specific as possible. If you're struggling to come up with reasons for why you are right. You should either rethink your opinion, because maybe you're wrong, or do some research, right? So, and I'll leave on that point, okay? So, after you express your opinion on that subject, like men should definitely have to pay child support no matter what. That's how I feel. I feel very strongly about it. That's my opinion. But if somebody says, okay, give me three to five reasons why you're right, and you kind of scratch your head and you can't think, you can't think of uh, reasons, maybe rethink your opinion. You don't have to change it completely, but maybe rethink it, maybe restate it. Rethink, restate your opinion. And as always, do your research. Do some research online. Learn more about the subject. Come up with some more points. Once you've done that, we can go to steps two, three, four, five of the process, but that's for next week. So thank you for tuning in. We'll pick up on assignment 26 on Monday. Have a great weekend.